Guys, welcome to the podcast. Today's episode is going to be a part five, episode 135. Uh, we're going to be talking about mid-morning setups on turkeys, kind of hunting them western style with our friend Chris Rowe at Rowe Hunting Resources. And I want to thank him for being on and spending so much time. I've gotten some great feedback from this seven-part series on western style turkey hunting. Uh, before we get to that, I want to thank you guys for listening and giving me all the support that you do. You can send me an email at jscottoutdoors at gmail.com. I also ask you to go on iTunes if you're listening on iTunes and give me a five-star rating and give us some good positive comments and feedback that helps our placement on iTunes. And uh, guys, uh, you can follow along our adventures at J. Scott Outdoors on Instagram and at Dar Colburn on Instagram. Also, check out our YouTube channel. Uh, this spring, we're going to be uploading a bunch of new videos, and our, we have a fairly popular YouTube channel, J. Scott Outdoors, our website, jscottoutdoors.com. Uh, we've got some Gould's Turkey Hunts for 2017 that I'm booking. Uh, Going to have a great 2016 Gould's Turkey uh, season here coming up, but uh, already booking a year out, so shoot me an email if you're interested. Uh, we also, at Colburn and Scott Outfitters, have a few coos deer uh, spots left, both uh, fully outfitted and do-it-yourself. So, guys, let's uh, get right to this episode. I want to thank my sponsors, GoHunt.com Insider, the title sponsor of this podcast, uh, Wilderness Athlete, Western Hunter and Elk Hunter Magazines, Phone Scope, Outdoorsman's, and Utah Hydrographics. Make sure to use the J. Scott promo codes when ordering and uh, buying products from these companies and you'll get uh, your discount. So uh, let's get right to this episode. Guys, God bless. What about you, sir? Oh, it's the most fun you can have with your clothes on. There's no question about it. <laughs> It's uh, fun hunting these ghoul birds. Yeah. Pretty birds. A lot of fun. Guys did a good job. I mean, when you kill a turkey, somebody's got to be doing something good. <laughs> Welcome to the J. Scott Outdoors podcast. Today, we are going to be talking with Chris Rowe of Rowe Hunting Resources, and we're going to be covering mid-morning and midday setups. And uh, we've already covered in this uh, uh, episode, or in this series, I should say, uh, we've covered scouting for turkeys, we've covered roosting turkeys in a two-part series, and we covered early morning roost setups. And we're talking kind of specifically about western U.S. And we're talking about Merriam's, we're talking about Rio's. Of course, uh, you could take a little bit of this into Goulds, and uh, I guess there's a few Easterns ar around. I know Washington's got a few Easterns around, I think. Uh, um, but yeah, I think, Chris, don't you agree you could use these tactics pretty much anywhere? You could use them in New York, probably, for that matter. Absolutely. Uh, hey, by the way, good to be back. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Um, Glad to have you. Yeah, no, absolutely. A lot of what we're talking about, you know, some people are going to say, well, there's a lot of overlap. Well, yeah, a turkey, and I think we touched on it uh, in one of the first couple episodes on, you know, a turkey's a turkey's a turkey. You know, I mean, a lot of times the differences that we have to deal with with birds is the fact that they're just interacting with their habitat differently, you know, and terrain. So a lot of these tactics are going to uh, kind of cross pollinate, if you will, on eastern wild turkeys. I mean, there's some places in West Virginia, Virginia, even Pennsylvania and some other areas where, I mean, you've got some serious, serious mountains and hills in the Appalachians. And, and so some of this terrain stuff might ring true for those guys that are hunting Easterns there. And like you said, yeah, Washington State has Easterns. Now, I know most of the places where I hunted e uh, Easterns in Washington State was over on the far, far uh, west coast, basically in that kind of temperate rainforest area. So yeah, there's there's serious mountains there too, but it's, it's a little bit different. But seriously, all of the tactics that dealing with birds, whether we're talking calling and decoys, I think there's a lot of overlap. Yeah, for sure. One thing um, that I wanted to 
Uh, just make sure I cover before we dive into this is that, you know, out west, in my opinion, the turkeys are not going to be near as um, predictable in their roost. And I think we talked a little bit about it, but I could hear somebody, you know, listening to the podcast that is maybe hunting an area where uh, on a particular, let's say, piece of private property or let's say on a piece of public and you know, you do have to watch a little bit that if your birds are consistently roosting in the same trees, if you set up on their roost areas and you start blasting turkeys and let's say you're trying to shoot multiple birds, you know, you know, one gobbler and then, you know, you want to hunt it three days later, you could potentially move these birds from that roosting tree or from that roosting area where where I hunt uh, mainly for uh, Merriams and Goulds they kind of roost all over and so but I, I, I would put it out there that if you know let's say you've got a piece of private property leased and it's a small piece and you've got birds that roost on your property that you know might venture around but you want them to always roost there um, you know, you're probably not going to want to do setups on those birds. So you're going to do more like what we're going to be talking about now, which is mid morning, midday, uh, you know, interceptions and setups. Um, and I think Chris, you can tell me your thoughts. Uh, if you let the birds roost and you don't mess with them, you let them fly off the limb and, you know, you give them an hour and then they're out and about doing whatever they're doing they're not going to really associate that pressure if you're if you're not intercepting them right there at the roost but but us western hunters you know it's not like a, a lot of guys back east will have the same you know same birds over and over and over and um you know they they, they don't want to interfere with that bird we don't run into that as much out west well, and I it, I agree a large part of that. I mean, again, I think we covered it in one of the earlier episodes about their movement and how they follow that snow line. So the one thing that people have to, and I don't care if you're hunting public ground or private ground, and I and quite honestly, actually, I, now that I I say that out loud and hear myself say it, I think maybe it does even uh, have more, possibly, possibly have more impact on people with private ground. Because unless you have a gigantic, gigantic ranch that encompasses a lot of, of good, diverse habitat, again, like we talked about before, if you're in the mountains, and, and especially if you're in the, in the mountains where it has snow, those birds are going to follow the snow line, they're going to follow the, the green up, and they're going to keep following the best available uh, habitat areas that, ha that offer the best food, cover, water, etc., but diversity of habitat is key and they're going to always keep following it well if you go in there and say it's early season and the birds are on your property early season you start pushing them too hard you could bump them and if basically what i guess just to cut to the chase you don't want to give them an excuse to move earlier than they naturally already want to go I mean, they may, they may be moving through and they may naturally want to be on your property say for three weeks but you get in there and you booger them, and now they're in there only for 10 days. You know, they, they, they just push through, they, they get di tired of the disturbance, and they just push through. And, well, now, now they're outside of your property boundary. On public ground, if you have a lot of acres and the, the habitat is diverse, well, maybe you can follow them across the landscape. And I know I've done that. But, yeah, Jay's absolutely right. You know, they, they may not, and they're probably not going to use the same exact tree. Now, again, we talked a little bit about that before. You know, if you have a situation, again, they're going to be focused in those ponderosa pine areas, most of the, and again, we're talking mountain merriams here, they're going to be focused a lot in the ponderosa pines, and they're going to generally, generally favor for roost trees, the biggest, most mature trees uh, that they have. So you might have a situation where you've got a, a creek bottom that's very diverse, a lot of willows, maybe some aspens, some good green grass coming in there, live water down in the bottom, 
good, you know, hillsides with, you know, young and medium age ponderosas. And then all of a sudden there's a couple isolated stands of just giant old growth ponderosas. Okay. You, you could pretty much say, yep, the birds are going to roost in those trees. But by and large, my experience is yeah, I kind of focus on a general area. They're going to be, fo they're going to be roosted on that ridge somewhere, or they're going to be you know, they're going to be roosting somewhere at this elevation somewhere. They're going to be a general area. And sometimes, like I even mentioned before, you can find them cycling on a multi-day rotation where one, one day they're in location A, next day they're in location B, next day they're location C, and the next day they're back at A, and they just move across that landscape. But if you bump them too hard and put too much impact in and around that roost site, do not be surprised when all of a sudden they just pack up and they head out. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so let's move into mid morning, midday setups. And so let's kind of take off uh, and start maybe right after what we had already talked about in early morning roost setups. And let's say that you either shoot a bird off your set or let's say that the birds move off and they went quiet or they move off and they're gobbling and moving away from you, you're then left with the choice of, you know, stay put. And we talked about that in the last episode where, you know, probably a good idea to stay put, do some calling, see if other birds that maybe were gobbling in the morning, because remember when we're sitting there with our back against the tree working the bird off the roost, we're also listening for other birds, taking inventory for either mid-morning uh, setups or even for where you're going to go try and set in the afternoon to maybe um, intercept a bird. So I like to stand up and when I stand up I kind of like to just ease up like a submarine periscope and kind of look in all directions you know kind of you know Make sure that nothing is out there loafing around that maybe didn't gobble or didn't come into the set, but that's just, you know, within within range. A lot of times I'll be, you know, looking with my binoculars and then a lot of times I'll go get my decoys um, and sometimes even on public land and stuff, I'll stash some decoys. So if you ever come across a stash of decoys, it's probably mine. <laughs> And probably just, you know, run and gun with, you know, maybe a Jake and a hen. I like the DSD Jake and hen. Um, but now what, what I'm doing in that situation is I am going to, let's, let's, let's take the, for instance, of now our, let's say we didn't get a bird, they flew off, they went the other way, and they're still gobbling. Okay, so what I'm going to do in that situation, if, you know, they've gone off, I can still hear them, they're working their way over, you know, and they're gone up a ridge or something. In my mind, I'm going to be saying, where are they going? What are they doing? Why are they going that way? Is there water over there? Is there feed over there? Did they see something in my setup? Did they hear something they didn't like? Uh, are, are, and I'm listening for their behavior. Are they acting just like normal turkeys? Everything's fine? Or is it kind of a shock gobble and they're kind of spooked and moving out and the gobbler's trying to say, hey, hens, come with me? Um, all that stuff is going through my mind in about a matter of, you know, 30 seconds. And... I like to make sure that nothing's around. So, you know, I might hit the call again. If I get a response, what I'm going to do probably if it's from the same group of birds is I'm going to work my way all the way and try and loop all the way around them and get, you know, I'll go out and around. Hopefully they'll gobble every now and then and I'll work my way all the way out in front of them and try and set up in front of them again. Curious what your first plan of attack is, Chris. Well, I, I agree with that. Um, and let me take one step back to what you said here just a second ago about standing up like a periscope. I think that's a great analogy because, yeah, vertical movement, especially if you got a big tree behind you, 
vertical movement up and down as you just kind of slowly stand up is going to be a lot less movement and a lot less more of a, or I guess, it's going to be a lot more significant if you're just up and moving laterally, left and right, flailing around and just standing up and move. They're going to catch that movement. If you just periscope up like that and take a moment and use your binoculars, that, I mean, I'll tell you right now, you could save yourself a lot of heartache if you did that. Because I have literally watched birds, mature gobblers, and heck, even jakes, will literally stand out. In a different, again, keep in mind, we're talking about, in most of these cases, we're talking about ponderosa pine forests. In some cases, they can be very, very open. You might be able to glass, you know, 300 yards, whether it's, you know, on the same slope you're on, or even if you're just across the canyon a little bit or across the, the valley a little bit, it can be open. I've literally watched them stand. Bolt upright. I mean, just flat out, stretched out as upright as they can underneath tiny, you know, young sapling ponderosas and just stand there like a stump and just watch everything that goes on around them. And then as soon as a hen walks out or something moves, they're like, oh, okay. And then pew, there they go over to join her. So just because you don't hear a response or just because you don't think they're coming they might be they they might be interested. They just might be coming a lot slower than you think, and they might be standing there watching. Again, remember, hens are supposed to go to the gobbler, and so if he doesn't see your decoys and he just hears you, you might have a bird, especially on public ground that's educated, that's just going to stand there and wait to see if that in fact is a group of hens that that's walking across the landscape that he hears. So, standing up like a periscope and using using your binoculars. Take 30 seconds to two, three, five minutes, whatever it takes. Just stand up, glass real quick, make sure nothing's there, and then set out if you want. Um, and I agree with you. I'm going to be evaluating how did those birds leave. Did they just not want to be with me? If that's the case, fine. And I'm going to, I, I like exactly what you said to do. Just sit, watch, figure out where they're going to go. And that's the beautiful thing about some of these mountain areas because if they're, if they, you know, feed their way down this little finger ridge, and they're going to drop down in the valley bottom. If you just sit there and watch them get down that, that little finger ridge and all of a sudden they hit the little creek bottom or whatever and you see them turn and they're just going to follow that creek bottom for a little ways, sometimes all you need to do is just jump up, crest the little ridge behind you, and just smoke down the other side with you know the ridge and terrain in between you and you can swing right around and get in front of you. Now, for me... I'm going to be really paying attention to, and Jay, you mentioned it, I'm going to be paying attention to that morning when I was calling and the birds were on the roost and they flew down. Were there other birds or do I have a reason to believe that there were other birds nearby? Because if there were other birds nearby, I am very, very likely just to stay put. I know that the gobbler was in front of me. I know he flew down with those hens. I know where he's going. I can hear him. I can see him or whatever. But I also know they didn't want any part of me. For whatever reason, they didn't want any part of me at that moment. So they're less likely, unless I can do what you just said, swing around and get set up where they, in front of where they want to be. I might just sit there and park it for the next three, four, five hours and just see if other birds come investigate my area because they heard me calling. So if there's other birds around and, and not only you calling, but they heard yes. all the birds yes. in the roost and they don't know what's going yes. on. They just know they don't hear anything. So, yeah, I think that's a good point that even though maybe you don't hear other birds in the distance, that does not mean that other birds didn't hear the whole commotion that was going on at the party. Yeah, we're just absolutely. Talking. And I talked about that YouTube video uh, our through the seasons video. Uh, that folks can watch about the, the mountain Merriams in New Mexico. That situation, I killed that bird because we parked it. Now, luckily, I had a ground blind and decoys, and Kelly was there with me, so I had more incentive to stay put. But I, seriously, the, I set up on roosted birds that morning. I called them in. I missed like an idiot. They took off, and then... I'm trying to figure out what the heck happened, and we're we're lollygagging there, and all of a sudden, here comes a bird down the ridge. He gobbles. Oh, scramble, get set back up. Let's go, and I called him in, and whack, done. Fill my tag because I worked a bird that I didn't even know was around only because he heard the commotion before, he heard my calling before, and he was out cruising. So don't get up and run away too soon. But if they are the only birds... 
that I know of, or I have any reasonable expectation to, uh, you know, encounter that morning, then yeah, Jay, I'm, I'm with you, man. I'm going to sit, I'm going to watch, I'm going to figure out where they're going to go. I'm not going to panic. I'm not going to try to get too frustrated and try to, you know, you know, go, you know, be stupid about it because, you know, you've got the right in most Western states, unless you've got, you know, kids with soccer practice or whatever else you need to do or baseball or whatever. If you've got the day to work those birds, most Western states allow you to hunt until sunset. So you've got some time. But, yeah, I'm going to try to figure out where are they going, what direction are they going, and can I get in front of them? Chris, let's take a quick break right there. Tired of relying on out-of-date numbers, spending too much on hunting consultants and seeing too little results? With Go Hunt Insider, the old way of doing things is over. With the introduction of draw odds and filtering 2.0, you'll have access to the most accurate, up-to-date information in the industry. You can filter by state, species, trophy potential, weapon, specific days or months of the year, harvest success rate, male-to-female ratios, and much more. All of this leads to easily finding the best hunt for you. So what are you waiting for? Visit GoHunt.com slash insider and join the movement. Use the J. Scott promo code when signing up and receive a $50 Kuyu gift card. Since 1982, the Outdoorsman's in Phoenix has made it their goal to provide the very best customer service combined with the latest and greatest optics and accessories in the business. Outdoorsman's is the leading designer and manufacturer of high-quality tripods, and mounting accessories for any hunter's optical needs. Go to Outdoorsmans.com or call 1-800-291-8065 and use the J. Scott promo code to receive 10% off all Outdoorsman's packs and pack accessories. Okay, Chris. Um, so I am going to try and now go and get in front of these birds and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick up and I am going to go use the terrain to my advantage. I'm going to figure on the path of progress, either that I heard them leave or that I saw them leave. And I'm going to attempt to go kind of out and around, either out and to the left, out and to the right, around the birds, keeping hopefully a ridge line or a bunch of trees or something in between because one thing about it if you're if they catch you moving throughout any of this process done the whole gig is up yeah at least for several hours anyway yeah i mean the last thing you want turkeys to know is that humans are around if 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 they realize they see humans uh, they're going to be extra wary and kind of on alert, and they're going to probably motor and get out of there. So I'm going to use the terrain to my advantage. And I think one mistake that I hear people doing when I know, you know, I'm in the woods and I hear people, and I'm like, okay, they're trying to loop around. Them. What they like to do is they like to call with their box call. As they're, okay. as they're going. As The same call that they just used at the roost setup, and they like to call as they're going around the bird to try and get the bird to answer. And I do the I do the opposite. I go around quietly in silence, anticipating that I'm going to get around them in time and get to where I think they're going to go. And if I have to, I'll blow a crow call to maybe elicit a shock gobble. But most of the time, I am just going to try and cover enough country to get around them. I'm going to use my binos as much as I can. And then when I get around them, all the way around, let's say they were at 12 o'clock and I've gone out and around, I'm going to get all the way. Now I'm in 12 o'clock position from you know, the, the line that I think they're headed. And a lot of times I'll just be glassing and I'll be listening. I find if you do shock them, yeah, they'll gobble. But sometimes if you shock them and you sound like a human, I've heard them gobble one time and then you never hear them again. I think yeah. it's better to just get in front of them and hope that you're 
your your plan is working. Stab a decoy, you know, out out in an open area um, where you think they're going to be. And then I think here's a critical thing. Pick your setup point where your tree that or your cover that you're going to get, uh, you know, the tree that you're going to sit uh, with your back to. I don't like to have that tree be right out on the open. I like to be a tree or two back. In other words, if they were to come into kind of an open area, even if it wasn't a meadow, if it was kind of an open area of ponderosas, I don't want to be right next to my decoy. I want to have a, a tree or something a little bit to my left or to my right so that when they come, they see the decoys, they kind of clear the area, and then they'll go ahead and come to the decoys. Um, I, I, you know, I think too many people set up right on the closest tree to the opening and, and they're going to get picked off because those birds eyes are so good. Yeah. Yeah. Thoughts? No, I, I agree. I mean, it, I, I do. I agree. Get yourself in there to where you're heading and try and if at all possible, depending on what the, the weather is of the day, I mean, if it's sunny, try to get yourself set up where you're in the shade. I mean, don't, and also don't forget about your gun. If you, especially if you're, if you're, if you're gun hunting, especially if you're bow hunting, I mean, a lot of times people, and you know, the shade from other trees is just, you know, 12 to 18 inches wide, whatever the size of the other trees are around you. And so a lot of people will sit up and they'll sit in the shade so their face and their bodies in the shade and completely forget that their legs, gun barrel, or if they need to draw their bow, now they just extended their hand and now it's in the sun. Well, going from shade into sun, that movement, it's going to coin. It's going to, it's going to stand out. So you got to be careful about that. But yeah, I, and, I do. And Chris, I'll add, sorry to interrupt, but I'll add one thing to that too. And I think mid morning, this is huge. When we're talking, you know, seven, eight, nine o'clock, 10 o'clock in the morning in that window, the sun seems to move quickly. Yes. Yes. And so what and, and now you've moved out and around those birds or let's say you're just freelancing. Let's say if a bird answered and he was a ways off, but let's say it might take him 15, 20, 30 minutes to get to you. Yeah, that sun is going to be moving the whole time. So I like to not only find a shady spot, but I like to set up on the side that's going to give me the most shade with the way that the, the sun is going. Yes. So it's going to be, you know, the sun's going to go this way. Okay, I'm going to have the most shade over on this side of the bush. I'm going to set up where the, throughout the next, say, hour or so, I'm going to be, have the most coverage of shade. Now, here, and here's another little tidbit that I'll give you as far as kind of what I think about. When we're talking about mid-morning until, you know, mid to later afternoon, when we're talking about, quote, unquote, that heat of the day, and I'll just use a generality there, the heat of the day, when the sun is kind of up and, and warming you, you know, we all know that as soon as the sun starts to hit the horizon, that the temperature starts to drop off. If the, in the spring, those birds, some of them, I mean, they're going to be trying to lay on fat, especially the gobblers. And if they've got, if they've had some really good winter range or uh, an easy winter, they'll have good fat and they'll have maintained some good fat. Well, you know, it, at night it gets really, really cold, even below freezing. Some mornings we'll be out there, and I mean, the ground is frozen solid, and there's a lot of frost in the air and stuff. But as it warms up during the day, sometimes if it's sunny, sometimes it can get downright hot. Well, keep in mind that sometimes those gobblers and those turkeys will actually get slightly overheated. They'll get really, really warm. So... If it's a very, very warm day, keep in mind is as they're moving, if they start moving across the landscape and it starts getting later on in the morning in the middle midday hours, it's not uncommon for sometimes those birds to work their way over onto shady patches or the shady side of a ridge or you know into thicker cover that offers offers them a little bit more shade. Same thing with you know, if it's really, really windy, they'll find those places that are going to allow them to tuck back into that cover and just get out of the wind. Whereas, if it's cold, say you've got a weather storm, you know, weather system coming through, uh, you've had recent snow or whatever, but it's cold, 
they'll do just the opposite. Sometimes as they're moving, they're going to work their way out onto those sunny, warmer slopes. Maybe those west face, southwest facing slopes that are, you know, the snow is melted off of. They'll work their way out into those areas and just kind of loaf and just soak up the sun. So keep that in mind. Pay attention to what your weather is. And if it's warm, don't. I mean, if, I mean, if it's just kind of a, a comfortable, cool day, they can be anywhere. But if it starts getting warm, I mean hot to where you have to start shedding layers, they're going to want to shed layers too, but they can't. So the only thing they can do is go bury themselves in the shade. Keep that in mind as you're trying to swing around and anticipate where those birds are likely to go. Or, and I don't, I don't mean to rush into the next idea, Jay, but you know, if, if, especially even if you're out looking for a place to just maybe set up for midday prospecting. Yeah, and let's talk about a little bit. We we just talked about the scenario where we're going to get out in front of the birds and what I'm going to do once we get out in front of the birds, get set up where I think they're going to be. And let's say that you're sitting there and you know you you're wanting to call. So, okay, go ahead and call. Now let's say that they gobble and they're not coming where you thought they were, but they're but they veered off to one direction or, up, or the other. The hard part there is, do I reset up again? Well, if you haven't called, one of the things I like about the fact that if you haven't called, you, you basically still have ammo, in the way I look at it, you still have ammo in your gun, meaning they haven't heard you call, they just happen to gobble on their own, they're not coming where I thought I need to move again. Sometimes you have to adjust your position. But know that every time you adjust your position, you have a chance of them seeing you. Mm -hmm. And so when you're moving into the last place you heard gobble, you have to anticipate that they're probably not exactly in the same spot and they could be moving. So I'm using my binos a lot, taking a couple steps, glassing, taking a few more steps. And then, then there's times also when you hear them gobble and you're like, I kind of have to throw caution to the wind because I know if I can get to that spot that I just walked by, let's say, and that's where they're headed, you know you got to get there. So I guess what I'm saying is sometimes there's a real slow kind of, you know, cat and mouse game. And then there's some times that you just say, I got to get to that spot. If I get there, they're dead. You have to be the judge of, you know, yeah. when that time is. Yeah. And and then I'll, I'll add a third one. There's some times where, and I think this is important, is one of the things I always talk about in my seminars. There's other times where you're going to swing around. You're going to think they are, say, well, I, you know, I swung way around. I think they should be about 200 yards away. I should, let me think about where, and all of a sudden, and he's, he is right there. You need to set up, and you need to set up now. Well, I would urge people to consider this. Sometimes I, ha I know I'm speaking from experience and making these mistakes. That bird gobbles. You look in front of you and 5, 10, 15 yards in front of you is a beautiful big old tree with a big gnarly stump and a blowdown next to it. It would be ideal to set up on. And so you're like, I got to set up. And you take three steps forward. And 80 yards down through the ridge, down through the trees, now all of a sudden, boink, there he stands. He saw you. You're done. Right. I, would, I can't tell you how many times that's happened to well, me. Well, and that's why I always tell people, do if that bird gobbles and, he, and you're moving, okay, if you're up, moving, up, moving, and you're trying to swing around him and you get in front and you think you should be close and you're thinking about setting him and all of a sudden he just, just rockets you and he's close – Either set up right where you are or behind you, wherever you just came from. Whatever path you just walked or you just ran, where you just came from, the odds are better that he didn't see you as you were making your way to that spot. So hopefully you have a higher percentage play that he won't see you if you go backwards. So if I'm standing out in the open or I'm just surrounded by little trees, but if I turn around and look back and I go, wait a minute, 10 yards behind me is a, is a great place to set up, backtrack. You're better off if you backtrack than if you go forward. Even lateral, left and right, can sometimes set you up for failure. 
most of the time, unless I'm standing next to a big tree, and, and I guess I should say that, if you're moving and for whatever reason you want to stop and either try to send out a locator, you know, usually, you know, crow call or raven or whatever, and you want to try to shot gobble them to see where they are, or if you think maybe I'll just use a box call or whatever, I'll, if you're trying to get a response from them, I know I am guilty of it, and I I know I will be guilty of it again this year. It's something that it is I always forget, but it's a critical. Don't stop and call in the middle of nowhere. St- st- at least get yourself next to a tree that you could set up on if all of a sudden he does gobble. So You have to always anticipate yes. that they're going to answer your call and they're going to be close. And if you if you do that... More times than not, when they do catch you with your pants down, quote unquote, you're going to be able to dive for cover. Yes. And, and I cannot tell you how many setups I've blown and seen blown and heard about my buddies blowing from he gobbled right on top of me. I tried to move one or two more trees. I blew the whole thing. Yeah. And sometimes it's best to just drop where you're yep. at, even if you don't have cover. Yep. All, it might just be a matter of going, no. And the bird just peeks over the top of the ridge and blasto and you've got your bird. And, and, you know, sometimes the perfect tree, and maybe we should have talked about this, um, you know, in, in, in early morning roost setups. Sometimes you just got to plop down and make it happen because there's, if you're always searching for the perfect spot, it ain't going to happen. Sometimes you just got to find the cover, get to cover and get ready. Get your get your mask up. Get your you know be ready. And um, and, and the other thing too is that, that people need to realize is even though you're moving around and uh, you're trying to swing around one group of birds. Again, we go back to are there other turkeys in your area? If there could be, or if there are, don't be surprised to find out that yeah, this group of birds roosted over here on this particular ridge up on that little knob, and then they flew down went away from me i'm swinging around and i kind of think they're going in this particular direction and hanging out for midday hours they may be going to a spot that has a lot of good food a lot of good you know water and grass and everything else there may be other birds making their same they were roosted somewhere else but that's where they're going to for their midday hours midday loafing and so you may actually just end up running into completely new birds so you always have to be ready but if one catches you off guard, sit down right where you are or take a couple steps backwards. You're better off going backwards behind you than trying to move forward or left and right and try to set up. Cause... And, the, and the theory of going backwards is he obviously didn't see you in that, <clears throat> the path that you just came from because he obviously gobbled. Exactly, exactly. And so – you know, retracing your steps going backwards is probably safer than going forward because you just came from there and he didn't see yep. you. And and sometimes they'll gobble just because they hear your footsteps in the in the pine needles. Right. And I, I totally agree with that. I've shocked them before where they hear me crunching in the pine needles and they gobble. <laughs> and, and then I go crunch, 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 trying to find the perfect tree instead of just setting up and, you know, hit, you know giving them a little soft call. I try and go for the perfect setup and it it nails me a lot of times. And, you know, I think too, in those times when those birds hit you, just, just, you know, and catch you off guard, sometimes you, you don't have time to set up the decoys. You don't have time to do anything other than just get down and get your gun ready, get your gun pointed in the direction of where the bird is. And you might have to be just sitting in the wide open and use your camouflage and hope it works. Yeah. And, I, and I've literally laid prone before, just just slammed down and just laid prone and point the shotgun barrel in the direction where he was. Or, and again, the same thing goes. Let's tie this into what we talked about earlier as well. Bird gobbles at twelve o'clock. He catches me off guard. I've got nothing to set up on. I go down and I lay prone on my belly and on my elbows. I am going to set up to where he is a 45 degree angle off of my whichever way, you know, if I'm right handed, he's going to be off to my 10 o'clock when I lay down. I'm not going to point my head, you know, I'm not going to be a straight line from my boots to my head to the turkey. Because if he swings to me, I'm right handed. If he swings around to my right, especially laying prone, you're never going to swing that shotgun. 
Yeah. But if I if he gobbles, he's twelve o'clock. I hit the dirt. My boots are going to be pointing like eight o'clock. My head is going to be pointing two o'clock. My shotgun will be pointed at twelve o'clock. That way, if I need to swing or adjust a little bit, I can a lot easier. And I I tend to if I get caught with my pants down, I I usually am just going to sit on my butt and get my knees up as if a tree was behind me. Um, you know, I feel like when you go to your belly, yes, you're more concealed, but your, 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 your movement is, is a little more hampered. You just have to use the terrain and decide what's best. Yeah, and that's fair. And um, that's, that's a fair assessment. I mean, you're absolutely right, but. I want to, uh, let's take a quick break here. Utah Hydrographics is in the water transfer printing service and they are open to whatever you can dream up. Choose from a wide range of camo patterns, designs, and colors. Whether it's guns, bows, tools, rifle stocks, vehicles, steering wheels, fenders, dashboards, paint guns, fishing rods, cups, tripods, watches, knife grips, helmets for a local sports team or for your motorcycle, picture frames, mailbox, animal skulls, you name it, they can probably do it. Utah Hydrographics loves taking things that are general looking and turns them into something that looks fantastic and eye-popping. Give them a call and see what they can do for you and receive up to a 10% discount by using the J. Scott 16 promo code. Visit them at utahhydrographics.com or on Instagram at Utah Hydrographics. Whether you are interested in elk, deer, antelope, bighorn sheep, or moose, Western Hunter and Elk Hunter magazines will bring the adventure to your mailbox. These publications feature articles on the finest hunting gear, tips and tactics from experienced hunters, field judging trophies, glassing techniques, calling strategies, and much more. To become a more knowledgeable and skilled hunter, subscribe today. Go to westernhunter.net forward slash jscott and enter your email address for a chance to win a $1,500 credit towards any Swarovski product. Okay, Chris, I want to talk about if your uh, morning setup just goes awry and now you're just off and running, you don't hear anything and you haven't heard any other birds and now you're just going to freelance. The decision at that point becomes, you know, do I go back to the truck because I didn't hear any other birds? Do I go back to the truck, drive down another ways, go in another drainage, pick a whole new spot, or do I stay where I'm at? I, I'm going to have to go off of, you know, did I hear other birds? Do I like the spot I'm in? Does it have a good feel? Um, you know, am I seeing any sign? Uh, or do I feel like sometimes your best opportunity, you just get that feeling that I, I, I don't like this. I don't like the way this looks. I want to go back to the truck. I, I you know, I want to grab a swig, swig, swig of water. I want to drive down a mile. I either want to keep freelancing and keep checking areas, or I have another spot I want to go to. L let's say that you are just going to go to another spot or you're just going to go kind of on a walkabout and make a loop, maybe check some waters, you know, and just go look for sign. I'm going to ask, what are you doing to get a, strike a turkey and get a turkey to gobble? I, I'll, I'll tell you what I do. And I got a box call right here. I like to just do a sequence like this. kind of soft with the box call, see if anything answers, and then a lot of times I'll do one more series and kind of pick it up a little bit. Kind of a lost hen, where are you, what's going on, and if nothing gobbles, I'll probably walk another two or three hundred yards. And at that point, I'll either decide to blow a crow call or I'll hit the box again. And now at this point, I've, I'm, I'm turned into a scouter. I'm just looking at sign. I'm kind of, you know, moving down a ridge line. Let's say it's still calm where I can hear off both sides. And now I'm trying to cover some country. If I'm in an area, I'm not seeing a whole lot of sign. I'm not feeling it. Maybe I'm going to walk faster. 
trying to maybe get over to another ridge, maybe consult my GPS and say, you know, I got let's just go over into the next drainage. Maybe they're rocking over there. Um, but I'm just out freelancing trying to strike a gobble. What are you doing, Chris? Well, <clears throat> very similar. One other consideration that I always throw in there is, you know, you mentioned, you know, do I think there's other birds in the area? You know, if if there are other birds in the area, then great. I can just I can head out from where I, wherever I already am, and then just make a big big loop, and then either come back to where I was that evening and, and try to to roost those same birds, or maybe I'll just do a loop, nothing, and then I'll just head out if if I don't think there's anything around. The other thing that though I I do keep track of is what 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 part of the season am I in as far as the behavioral cycle of the birds? Are they are they locked down with hens right now and just flirting and maybe doing a little breeding or are they locked down with the hens and they're actively breeding, which means, or, or more importantly, are the, are the hens at any point going off and laying an egg? And if so, how many birds, how many hens does he have with him? If he's got a big flock of hens, then he's probably going to be stuck with them all day long. But like we mentioned before, if we start getting later on in the season and he only has a couple hens, at some point those hens are going to go leave him and they're going to go off and lay an egg. And a lot of times they will fly down together, they'll mill around, they'll, you know, they'll breed and, and flirt around with one another. They'll fill their crops, fill their guts, and then all of a sudden those heads are just like, gone, we're out of here. So if I think that I'm in that situation where it's later on in the season or I think that he doesn't have many hens and I think that the hens are going to be going off and laying. Quite honestly, I very well may make one or two quick excursions, you know, a few ridges over or a few drainages over or whatever. But man, a lot of times, most of the time, I'm going to swing right back and I'm going to go right back to either where I was set, where they were roosted, or the last place I worked them or the last place I heard them. I'm going to just sit down and park it and, and go from there. But if I'm running the ridges, just trying to prospect, I'm doing the same thing. For me, I just, I always advocate people, you know, the first turkey call I think anybody should ever buy. If you're a new hunter listening to this, get yourself a good box call. And and you don't even have to spend a lot of money. I know, you know, I'm not associated with Primos uh, formally anymore, but I mean, heck, their their box cutter, single sided yeah. box call, yeah. is it like fifteen? I think it's fifteen to twenty dollars. It's the che- one of the cheapest. It is an awesome, awesome call. I got one sitting right here in front of me. They're an awesome call, and they're not that expensive. Yes, they I'm they sound better with time, and they just they're a great box call. But get a box call to start because not only are they e- the easiest to learn on. I really do. I think they are probably one of the most effective calls to use, period. And I think they are sometimes the best calls to use when you're running and gunning and prospecting because there's something about that friction sound that'll cut the wind. It'll cut through, you know, the mountains, it, just the way the terrain is. And, I mean, it just elicits a response sometimes where you don't, you just can't get one any other way. And I'm doing the same thing. I'm going to start off soft. You know, I never know if there's a bird around. I'll start off, start off soft do a couple series of yelps, I'll pick it up a little bit, pick it up a little bit more. And then the other thing too is if I think there should be somebody somewhere nearby that should be able to hear me, the other thing that I I do do is I will call as I am walking. Because I think some birds get educated to the fact where all of a sudden, boom, out of nowhere, here's a hen, quote unquote hen, us calling, or a hunter calling, a hen starts yelping, yelp, 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 yelp. Nothing sits quiet for a while, listens. Yelp, 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 from the same exact spot. Yelp, 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 nothing. And then there's nothing for a while. And then all of a sudden, over here, down the ridge, yelp, 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 yelp. Nothing for a little bit. Yelp, 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 no, no. Okay, if you listen to a hen walking across the landscape, that you can pinpoint that pretty quickly that, nope, that's not – I mean, if you hear another hunter do it, you'll know instantly that that's a hunter. They, that's not a hen. Because So two things in there. Number one, 
if you're going to call from the same spot, well, it doesn't matter. If you're going to call over an extended period of time, it is extremely easy to do for humans. We like patterns. Our, our whole brain is hardwired to find and follow and, and embrace patterns. And so it, you will subconsciously find yourself, you might favor, you do a five-note string. And you don't even realize that every time you run that call, whether it's a box call, mouth call, doesn't matter. You do five notes. That can be very easy to pinpoint as fake as well. So be very conscious of trying to change up the number of notes you, you, you yelp out there. If you're using yelps, change that up. But the other thing, too, is the whole point of about you prospecting is your your what you're relaying the idea of is you are a hen out there or at least this is what I do I'm not going to say you and, and as it, the ubiquitous you of everybody what I do if I'm going to try to prospect I am going to make it seem like I am a hen by myself looking for someone so that way I you know if a gobbler's around there he's like ooh she's she's searching I either need to respond so she knows where I am, or I need to start cutting the distance to make eye contact with her. Well, if I truly am a real bird, if I truly am a real hen, then I'm probably not going to be stationary. That hen is going to be moving across the landscape looking, and as she's moving, oftentimes she's going to be yelping. So I will stop, I will yelp a couple times, and I will listen. But if I know that I need to continue my yelping in order to try to elicit a response, I will sit for a little bit, but then I will start to walk to make it seem like, yes, this hen is actually out there. She is seeking. She's out there prospecting. That way, if all of a sudden you know, I, I walk maybe 50 yards and I've yelped a little ways, well, he's heard me going in a particular direction. He's heard me traveling. If I go quiet for the next two minutes, five minutes, or whatever, and then all of a sudden I start vocalizing again from this other knob in the same direction I was just going, well, it's plausible. He already heard me going that way. It just kind of helps seal the deal a little bit better. and gets a little bit – I have a better time eliciting a response that way than I do if I just stop, start, stop, start, et cetera. Okay. Okay, you're out prospecting, and you go – off in the distance you hear a gobble okay okay that's that's to me it's like dang it great i got a gobble but now do i try and close the distance or do i sit my butt down and try it from here and i think that's the question that everybody wants to know the answer to and i don't know that there's a right answer I think that you have to kind of judge the intensity of the gobble. How quickly did they respond to you? You know, um, a lot of times if I'm prospect, you know, lost yelping and a bird gobbles way off in the distance, I might just not, not do anything. I might just listen, 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 listen. Boom. Double gobble. You know, he gobbled and he, and he's, kind of gobbled more intense like I thought I heard a hen I answered you where did you if I get that double gobble then usually I'll answer them back and then the next in my mind what happens next tells me what's going to happen and that's the hard part a lot of times if they go quiet they could be just walking towards you so you should plant your butt down or they could be over in their strut zone just answering you and they're going to continue to gobble for the next hour in the same spot. What do you do, Chris? What do you do? I know I, I haven't told my answer what I do, but I know it goes through my mind every time. Go to them or sit your butt down. Well, my I, I agree on both of those things. Number one, I'm going to judge how far away was he or at least how far away do I think he is. Because that's the other that's the other problem with the mountains. We have to make sure people understand. Sometimes the louder gobbles are actually across the canyon. 
up on the other side. The other side, because it's a straight shot. I mean, there's nothing in between his little vocal cords and your ear. He just goes straight across the canyon, dead air. Whereas sometimes he might be below you down the ridge or down the valley or whatever, and there's all the trees and everything else, and or he's just up over the other side where you can barely hear him, and you're like, well, where was he? Well, he's he's on your side. He's right there. It's just the way the terrain is, so always keep that in mind, too. Um, sometimes echoes, and, and the, that's the other one. Sometimes you can end up being listening to echoes. you got to understand what the terrain looks like and, and how that can play into it. But if I think the bird – I how far away is he, all right? If he's, I mean, way off in the distance, then I'm going to do exactly like you did. I'm going to answer him, and I'm going to answer him very excited. I'm just going to do a long string of yelps, just high pitch, fast pace, just yap, 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 to where I'm like, ha, ha, I found you. And, and I'm going to, from there, I'm just going to put my calls away, and I'm just going to run. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. I am going to run. And just cover ground. Can I add something there? Sure. Picture it as if you're lost. Yes. And you've been out wandering around in the forest and you don't know where you're at. And all of a sudden you hear a friend or a family member. Just another Chris, human. Just another human. Chris. Yeah, yeah or another human. You're not going to just go, hey, I'm over here. You're going to go, I'm over here. I'm over here. I'm over here. Yeah. Yeah. And in my in my mind, when I do respond, I'm going to respond the same way. You know, I'm going to be excited. I'm going to have some tone and some, you know, I'm going to infer that I'm excited that you're calling back to yes. me. Because then he's like, wait a minute. All right. She's interested, which does two things. Well, three things. I mean, he can start moving his way towards you, but... A lot of times what it does, it'll get him at least to be more interested to gobble back. He's going to at least sound off maybe once more, twice more. And if nothing else, he's going to park his butt and stay. Because the other thing that I'm going to do, if I know he's a long way away, sometimes what I'll do is I'll, I'll start responding to him very excitedly. But I'm going to start moving his direction. He's going to hear that. And I want him to know I'm I'm starting to move that direction. Because if I just show up, you know, pop up and, and too close to him. If he doesn't know I'm coming, it, sometimes it can cause a problem. But most of the time, is if I'm going to respond, let him know that I heard him, and I'm going to close the distance. I'm going to close it fast. When I think I've gotten within 150, 200 yards of where I think that bird is, I'll start calling again and try to pinpoint his location. And I will, and I will maintain the continuity of the eagerness that I had before. If he and 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 I guess let me take a step back. I don't want to jump ahead. Sorry. If he's way off in the distance, I'm going to respond to him, let him know I heard him, and then I'm going to just beat feet and haul butt to close distance. If he gobbles and he is within some, he's within striking distance where I don't have to really run and make up a lot. Of, I mean, he's within a couple hundred, a few hundred yards. He's not under 100, 150, but he's a few hundred yards away. Then a lot of times what I'll do is I'll just I will maintain that continuity, I will respond to him, and I will yelp, and I will start moving his way and let him know that I'm moving his way. If he's really, really close, just park it. But if you just park it, if he's really, really close, this is another thing that I've seen people do, and I think it messes up setups and causes birds to hang up. Again, if you're out prospecting, and if you do what I do, not saying you have to, but if you do, I am moving across the landscape and I am calling. It is a great way to get a response. However, on tricky birds or educated birds, keep in mind, he hears where you're walking. He hears where I'm calling. I've had them where they cut the distance. And they all Fast, faster than you. They do. cut it faster than I, I do, and all of a sudden, here we are in those situations where he's 80 yards away, just over the ridge, and oh, 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 and he's just boom right there. Now, a lot of people will slam their butt down, or they'll get themselves set up, and they'll get ready, and when they go to call again, they go, yo 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 yo, just real soft. 
Just a couple notes. Just Okay, now, hold on a minute. You just portrayed a hen that was out of her mind lonely, or at the very least, she was out walking and prospecting and looking for someone. He cut the distance. He gobbles, and he's 80 yards away. And then all of a sudden, it goes dead quiet. And then this hen is like, oh, I'm over here. I'm just kind of milling around. Just like Jay said. No. He gobbles. Gobble, gobble, gobble. I'm a, I am immediately going to be. Gop, 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 gop. And then I'm going to park my butt. Because I'm going to say, where are you? I'm excited about being with you. Park my butt. Get my gun on my shoulder. And I'm going to continue to call a little bit. At least a few notes, the same volume, the same cadence, and the same level of excitedness because I want him, yes, I put, I put the brakes on. Yes, I stopped because, oh, you're close. I'm looking for you. Where are you? But I want to make sure he understands that I still have the same intent and I still maintain that, that continuity that he's expecting. Now, obviously, if he's way the heck and gone out there and I've got to run and cover a lot of ground, well, when I get closer on that other side, I don't necessarily have to run. And we haven't even talked about cutting and, and excited calling and all that stuff. But if I get over on that other side and I think I'm close, I'm not going to start off just yop, 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 yop. No, I'm going to I'm looking for you. I heard you over here. Where are you? Yop, 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 yop. Most of the time he's going to boom because he's expecting it. She was excited up on that ridge. I heard her coming down that ridge. I didn't hear anything for a while, but oh my gosh, here she, no, she, no, she came. She's right over here. She's right next to me. Go, go, go. He's going to at least respond a little bit better because I maintained the imagery that I was portraying from the get-go. Bingo. Now, when he hammers, you close the distance and he hammers, and he hammers hard. That's when I'm going to play a little more hard to get and make him search me out because now I've closed the distance and he knows I've closed the distance and he knows I'm excited to see him. But I think there's a point when you've relayed your message and you've got to let him search you out a little bit. Yeah. Agree agree or disagree? I, I agree. And that's the thing. That's where the trickiness comes in is, is and I, I guarantee people are listening to this going, well, wait a minute. You just said, what? How do, if you listen to a bird respond to you, if he starts, I mean, if you yelp and all of a sudden, boom, he, say he's 300, 400 yards away down the ridge. Oh, oh, oh. All right, I'm going to double, I'm going to respond, I'm going to answer him. I'm going to see what the response is. If if he gobbled once and I respond and it's quiet. He doesn't say anything. I'm going to start going, "Okay. Uh, what is he doing? Is he coming? Is he and I'm going to stay put for a little bit. Start up call a little bit more. Wait, listen. Wait, and if I hear no response, a lot of times at that point, I'm like, you know what? He very well may be easy. One of two things. He's either just not that interested. He gave me one token gobble just to let me know where he was. And he's just Cur locked down with his hand. gobble. Yeah. Or he's on his way. And so at that point, I'm setting up. I'm sitting there. And that's exactly it. I'm going to play it safe for a little bit. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to let him come and seek and search. And a lot of times, I will wait to do anything until I hear him gobble again. If he gobbles again, he's in the exact same spot. All right, I need to move. I need to I need to play this differently. But if he's moved and he's made his way closer to me, just keep just let him come. Let him come and let him seek you out. And 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 I think you make a great point there and I think one of the tricks that that I think is so deadly and I had to learn this the hard way a bunch of times is okay, he he knows that you're excited to see him. Everything, it's sounding like a perfect match. He's gobbled several times. You can tell he's coming your way. I like to let him gobble, and he gobbles. And, you know, you're personally, you just want to call back. You want to call back so bad. But he, you've already conveyed to him that, yes, let's get together. Everything's good. You know, let's do it. I guess literally. Yeah. <laughs> um. But then he gobbles again, and oh gosh, I want to call. I want to call, and the last gobble was intense, intense, but I can tell he's closing. 
I might let them gobble, and you just have to kind of play it by ear and their intensity. Sometimes they'll gobble two or three times coming hard, and if you don't answer, it makes them come even harder to you. Yeah, and that's the thing. And then about four gobbles in, give them just a just yep, yep, yep. give them a I'm here. There everything's you go. just like, just what you thought, and then they come even harder. There you go, and that's and that's the key right there. If that bird again. Okay. Biologically, the hen is supposed to go to the gobbler. That is why he's got that bread, bright red, white, and blue head. That's why he struts. That's why he gobbles. He is the showcase. He will make up 80 A lot of them will make up 80% of the distance, but a lot of times they expect that hen to commit and make that last. The, the hen is supposed to go to the gobbler. So, yes, while I am prospect, I want to sound like a bird that is seeking and looking. And if he gobbles, great. But in those situations where he gobbles and he's eager and he's clo- and he's relatively close, he could respond and come in and be and, and actually work into your setup. If you, I always will maintain the, the the momentum. But then if it seems like he's interested or he's lollygagging a little bit, I will t- I will start to taper off, and I will start to make it sound like okay, well yes, I finally oh thank goodness I found you. But I'm really content where I am now. I, I'm I'm happy. I've got a good feeding spot here. But I'm glad I found you. But I'm and I'm interested. But I'm not going to run you over. I'm not going to keep running into you. That's where you've got to tone it back and sucker them in. And so yeah, let them gobble. Let them gobble. Let them gobble. Because again, if he if he, you're making your way and you're excited, and he gobbles and he stands there and struts. He the more excited you continue to be at this point. The more likely he's just going to say, "Well, I, she's on. She's going to come and she's going to join me." So when they, if they are fired up, and I've heard this, I've heard this repeatedly, and from a lot better turkey hunters than me, if they are cranking, you tone yourself back. But if they are tight lipped and they are really, you know, low key and they're just not really respect, then you crank up. Basically, do the opposite because if they're fired, fired up, then make them seek you out. And the only way that you're going to do that is just to play it, just let their curiosity get the best of them, let them gobble two, three, four times in a row on their own. But then if you give them any sort of direction, any sort of uh, other response, just stop, 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 stop. just one or two, just saying, Yep, I heard you. I'm still here. So, or, and, and if they really, really hang up, I'll, I'll grab that gobble shaker. But I mean, that's a whole other discussion too, but. Another, another thing, um, to discuss is that same scenario where you, you know, <laughs> off a of pretty good ways. The very next thing you hear is. <laughs> yeah. Personally, immediately, I'm right back on that hen. Whatever cadence, however many strokes she hits, I mimic her. All right, so you're, so you, in other words, you you know it's a real hen, not another hunter. Yeah, if I hear a bird gobble, but then I hear a hen answering yeah. me, yes, I'm going to answer that hen, and I'm always going to answer that hen in the same type of situation she's answering. If she's I'm going to go, you know, if she just, I'll go, and I'm going to try, if she answers me back, boom, I'm going to hit her right back. If she answers me back, boom, I'm going to hit her right back. Hopefully she's going to start picking up the volume and picking up the pace and really hitting me. I'm going to just keep going back and forth and, and trying to keep the communication with her on. Now, See, they're going to do one of two things. She's either not going to like it and she's going to take the whole flock and go away from me or she's going to bring the whole flock to me. And in my mind, I'm the only chance I have is for her to bring the flock to me. And in that situation, I think you got to keep a conversation going with her. And then once she starts headed your way, then you kind of play it by ear and do that, you know, 
Let her seek you a little bit. Let her come a little bit. Maybe let her call a couple sequences and don't answer. Then she calls again, then hit her again. And she calls a couple more times. She's getting closer. Then maybe hit her again. But at that point, they're moving your way. You kind of got to play it by ear then. Your thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. So if you're ever working a gobbler and all of a sudden a hen starts yelping, and, and keep in mind that, you know, jakes will yelp as well, and you might be ended up working with some jakes, but regardless, even if you do, what Jay's telling you, it's going to work because the jakes will come in. But if you hear a hen, if a boom, oh, he gobbles over there, and all of a sudden hen starts cutting up, at this point, that gobbler's irrelevant. You're not, call, you're not calling the gobbler. You're not. And now, maybe, hopefully, if you're lucky, maybe they've got a couple, a two-year-old or so that are kind of lollygagging with them, and, and they break away and want to come with, come to you. And again, if that's the case, then what Jay just told you is going to work, and they're going to call them in. So either you have no net loss on doing this. But if that bird is locked down with those hens, or if, if even if there's more than one gobbler with those hens, if they're sta- if they're locked with those hens. It's irrelevant at this point that the gobblers are there. You have to call that hen or that group of hens to you. And the only way that you're going to do that is to just absolutely, I I do exactly the same thing Jay does. I will mimic her. The only thing that I will do that I will add into this, and this is where it is important to have multiple calls, multiple types and styles of calls, and why I think people should take some time to learn how to do a, a turkey mouth diaphragm. I oftentimes will be cranking with the box call, that high-pitched, high-fast, and just doing everything that she is doing. If if that is how she's calling, I'm going to be feeding it back to her. But then every now and then, I'm going to start throwing in with a different call, most of the time with a mouth diaphragm, a real raspy, low-pitched mouth diaphragm. I'm going to do that low and slow, that ow, 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 basically where I'm a boss hen saying, you guys need to listen to me and follow me. This is we're staying over here, and so I'll throw it, start throwing that. Now, if the real hen starts doing that to you, you have zero choice, zero choice at all. You got to hit her back with that because that's what she's saying. But if she starts going that ow, 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 to you, just real raspy and just low and slow, she's telling you you need to come to me. You need to get over here. You need to be with us, and that I'm the one in charge, so I dictate the pace you're going to have to just, it's going to be a battle between who's the nastiest, raggediest, you know, raspiest hen on the mountain, and you just essentially have to piss her off. Have you guys heard about PhoneScope? PhoneScope is a privately held company that makes custom molded, precisely engineered smartphone digiscoping adapters. Photographing wildlife has never been easier. Take digiscoping photos and videos from your smartphone and share them with your friends. PhoneScope stands behind their product with a 100% money-back guarantee. PhoneScope is the future of digiscoping. Get yours now. Use the JSCOT16 promo code and receive 10% discount on all purchases. Check them out at PhoneScope, that's P-H-O-N-E-S-K-O-P-E dot com, or on Instagram, at PhoneScope. Wilderness Athlete is committed to improving the health and quality of life for the outdoor athlete by providing field-tested, scientifically validated nutrition and sports performance products. Check them out at wildernessathlete.com and use the J. Scott promo code to receive 10% off any order. I like it. Hopefully, and hopefully she does too and brings the whole flock to you. Now, the other thing too, and the, and the problem, oh, and I, this is, these are the situations I hate. You know, earlier on, both Jay and I said we love two-year-olds, and I do, because a lot of times they're so eager, they're stupid, and they just come running in. The problem is, is we're in these situations where you have to call the whole flock. Man, most of the time, just like elk, the gobblers are going to be in the back of the group, and sometimes, they, and especially in the mountains, if you got a larger flock, they can be strung out across 60 yards. You know, the, the lead hens are up front. The gobbler's not, you know, he's 40, 50, 60 yards behind coming up the rear. A lot of times I've had the hens just literally in my lap, and you're just, you're just struggling. You're like, oh, please don't pick me off, and, you know, just waiting for the gobbler to clear and hopefully get close enough. 
Yeah, for sure. Uh, you know, for me, I love mid-morning setups uh, for this reason. I love that eight, nine o'clock sun, how intense, you know, the, it finally gets bright. And I love when those, especially the Merriams and the Goulds gobblers, uh, when they come in mid-morning and you see that white on their tail fan and, you know, the black and the iridescent on their feathers, uh, whereas, you know, sometimes early morning roost setups, you know, the light's still low and pretty dim. You don't get to see the vibrant colors. But I love when you get that, you know, 8, 30, 9 o'clock, you know, call in where a bird, you know, the grass is green uh, or greener. And there's that contrast of that sharp sun and they come strutting in. I love that time. It's just a great time uh, to kill birds. And um yeah, and the, I, and the other thing too, and I just thought of this, and I'm I'm looking at the time, so I know you want to probably wrap this one up here pretty quick. But um, you know, the other thing too, it, I can't. I think this ties it back into what we started with. You know, how do we know? Do we do we get up and move, or do we chase after the birds? The other thing too that's awesome about that time in the morning, and especially in spring, especially if you've been hunting for several days, that is the most absolute awesome time to take a nap. i mean seriously if the if the birds you're working that morning don't cooperate and you go and you try a couple other spots and it just doesn't seem to work seriously again they're out there they're feeding they're gonna they're gonna take their time to breed and and do whatever they do farting around with one another they're gonna take their time to fill their crops and and fill their you know uh, fill their crops once that's done, then they kind of relax. Then, you know, they, they just got to basically hang out for the rest of the day and they get a little bit more restless. Well, it can take a couple hours. And so seriously, man, I, I can't tell you how many times I've worked birds in the morning. I've gone off. I've tried to prospect. I've gone and looked for them or I've tried to follow them or I've tried to swing around, whatever. And I get to that about eight, nine o'clock time frame. You know what? Park it. Find a sunny spot, lay out, take a nap, and I can tell you right now, I don't. Uh, numerous, numerous times, I have been jerked awake by a gobble just down the ridge. Yeah, and I mean, I'll do the same thing if you're getting sleepy. I'll just go through a series of and just really get after it. For, you know, a few minutes, really get through, some, you know, just call a bunch and then just lay back and go conk for 30 minutes. And you may have a bird way off that doesn't even answer, but it's working its way towards you. By the time that whole flock gets to you, you wake up and, you know, they're all around you. So definitely call before you, you know, lay back to take a little snoozer and uh, it can't hurt. And even when you wake up, give yourself a little bit of yelps and see what's around. Yep. And um, I, I think we did a good job there covering kind of mid-morning, mid-day setups. And I appreciate having you on. I want to give you a chance to tell the listeners how they can find you. Chris? Yeah, absolutely. As always, just rowhuntingresources.com, R-O-E. Row is R-O-E, huntingresources.com. Uh, our website is a educational-based website, mostly video-based. Uh, it's a subscription-based deal, so if you guys want to subscribe and, and see all the stuff that's in there, there's different modules, but uh, as always, if you get through there and it asks for a promo code at the end, just type in J. Scott Podcast, all one word, J. Scott Podcast, it'll knock 20% off. But if you want to kind of follow us along, by all means, follow along on Instagram, uh, check out our videos on YouTube, on our YouTube channel hit us up on Facebook or whatever, but it's all just row hunting resources. You'll find us there. Awesome, buddy. Thanks for uh, coming on and spending time with us. Absolutely. Anytime, my friend.